conversation. Uh, he always makes me laugh. And, uh, we have we have a good time, and, and uh, what a what a beautiful family. Congratulations. Uh, Abby and I know, did you ever find Glory? I mean, I, I talked to her, but yeah. you found, okay, all right. Just want to make sure we're good. She if we needed out. to suspend things and go find her, but I know she's helping uh, with different things. And um, it is great to be back. Uh, it's kind of weird, you know, thinking 10 years, that's crazy. And I think last year was the first year uh, we missed not coming uh, every year. And uh, I'm not sure really what happened with that, but, you know, we're, we're back. And, and uh, so, so glad to be here on this special day. And um, before we move on, uh, I know it's not, you know, clergy or pastor appreciation uh, month, but my wife and I really do, uh, you know, pastor had some amazing words uh, for us, but we really believe in honor. The Bible talks about uh, to give honor to whom honor is due. And uh, let's, let's take out church for just a moment. Um, don't you like to get a pat on the back or a thank you or a well done or a, that a boy, you know, any of those things? We all... We all, let's, let's be honest, you know, not to try and super spiritualize, we all need those things sometimes. We all want those. Yes, we, we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. We can, we can quote all those Bible verses, but the reality is we all like to be encouraged. We all like to be done, uh, told that we're, you know, at your job or whatever the case is. And uh, your pastors give so much. I know that they, uh, you know, they do the pastoral care. They do the visitation. They they have the conversations. They they marry. They bury. They do all of that stuff. But in reality, and I know some would say, well, that's their job. Well, not really. You know, according to the Bible, the Bible is tells us that their job is to be the spiritual leader, and uh, that's what their job is, and that's what they're doing. And so. Uh, Pastor, uh, I know this is not just for you, um, but it also for your wife as well. And so would you just give honor to your pastors and thank you for your leadership, your spiritual leadership. Um, you know, a, an example of the spiritual leadership was just what took place just a few moments ago, that the Lord was speaking and moving uh, to them and then give that to the church. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's not always fluff. It's not always the, it's going to make you feel good. Sometimes it's the kind of, kick in the backside that we need to, hey, church, we need to get with it. And uh, it's the first time I heard about the chairs and the carpet. That's awesome. That's exciting. And uh, some church is going to be blessed with these pews. But I'm going to enjoy coming back next time, whenever that is, and sitting in a chair. Even though the pew is okay, they're great for sleeping in, but uh, it'll be nice to, to have a chair, right? Amen. Okay, so a few of us are excited about that. Good. All right, well, turn your Bibles to the book of First Samuel uh, chapter 3. We're going to get there in just a few moments, but have any of you ever played Follow the Leader? Maybe not like Yesterday or last week, you know, because we're a little bit more mature, we're a little bit more sophisticated now. But maybe you have to think back to when you were in middle school or elementary school or uh, Sunday school or something like that. But, um, you know, follow the leader is fun. And uh, I think we have some pictures. Yeah, you see these little kids. I mean, you know, that that's what is so fun. I, Pastor talked about uh, us being in youth ministry and, and very kind words. And by the way, I... You got. I'm going to sign you up that you're going to Wales with us next year, okay? That would be awesome. And, uh, you know, follow a leader is so fun. And I always like being the lead. I mean, that's just kind of, that's kind of my nature. I'm like, I like being the lead. And probably because in my demented mindset, I wanted to make it the most difficult, <laughs> tricky. I mean, I wanted, you know, not just, okay, let's, you know, march like this. I wanted them to crawl under things and jump over things and kind of, in a way, maybe hope they fell or, you know, whatever, you know, all that kind of stuff. But that was the, that was the leading part. And how many of you naturally uh, gravitate towards being a leader? Okay, a couple of us. Well, then the rest of you are the, the follower. You were the ones that were the ones behind, and you were just kind of going along, and whatever the leader said, that's what you did, and all of that. But no matter if you were the leader or the follower, it made me think about what was that for you? If you were the leader, what thoughts went through your mind? Not necessarily in um, follow the leader at that time, but as a leader. What goes through your mind? No matter if it's in your job, if it's in your home, uh, in, in a, your personal life. <coughs> but what about you as a follower? Are you one of those that needs to be in control? Or are you okay with letting somebody else take the lead? How do you feel 
when maybe somebody that's leading you makes it tricky, makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, maybe there's a struggle that's involved. You know, all of those questions um, kind of go through my mind, and uh, we've probably all been on both sides. Well, if you're a leader, you're not always a leader. The reality is all of us are following somebody. Uh, there's nobody, maybe with the exception of the President of the United States, who, you know, as the, the, the leader of the free world and all of that, but we are all, no matter if you are the CEO, you are the boss, you are the big dog, whatever it is, we all have to follow somebody. And then if you're a follower, that puts you in a whole other category of having to think through all these dynamics. we are all been on one side. So today is a day that um, is really nationwide, is uh, National Youth Day. That's what uh, this day we're celebrating, and I, I love this day. Uh, it's different from Speed the Light Day when we come normally on that day. But today is a day. I want you to think about the magnitude. Pastor talked about fine arts this weekend. And uh, you're emphasizing camp uh, for the fundraiser after service. And uh, we talked about the missions trip. I want you to think about that in the Assemblies of God, just the Assemblies of God alone, nationwide, we have almost 13,000 churches. Okay, that's awesome. Incredible. And in those churches... Uh, and I know some would be, keep better records than others. We have almost 400,000 students just in middle school and high school. Now, that doesn't count the children necessarily. That's just middle school and high school age. So I want you to think about that for just a moment because what that does is that should challenge us to realize that we have an incredible opportunity right now in the palm of our hand, right at the cusp of where we live our life. So when pastor talks about, you know, what, what we do, first of all, it's not a job. It's a calling. Amen. My junior in high school, God called me to, the, uh, to ministry, but specifically youth ministry, and I'm still doing it. Yeah, I know, I'm, as pastor said, we're around the same age. Uh, he looks better, and he's a lot younger looking than I am. But you know what? Uh, a lot of people say, hey, when are you going to get a real job? You know, when are you going to grow up? Well, when God calls me. When he tells me to move, that's when I'm going to move. When he tells me to do the next thing, that's what I'm going to do. So in the meantime, Abby and Glory, you guys are stuck with us. <laughs> PK retreats and camps and, and all that kind of stuff. But I think about the opportunity that we have. But it's also a tremendous responsibility. But you know what? We don't bear that our own. We don't bear that. Yes, we have uh, the title of district youth director for the state of Kansas, and, and we get to do those things. But you know what? That responsibility does not just fall on my wife and I. Your responsibility is not just for your family. Your responsibility is not just for yourself and your family, but I want to challenge us today. I believe that we all bear that responsibility, just like baby dedications. You know, we, we've been a part, we've seen uh, all of those, and you know, the, the reality is when we, are baby, uh, when we are dedicating that baby, we're not saying, hey, this baby is going to make it to heaven because of that, because they have to make their own decision when they get to a certain age. But not only is it for the parents, but what I like about that is at that moment, it's for all the church as well. Right. Because we bear responsibility, not that we're to say, hey, uh, parent, you need to raise and train your kid this way, or hey kid, not do this or don't do that. There may be times for that, but the reality is, and you're going to see what we're looking at this morning, is we bear an incredible responsibility, as you saw the title of the message, to lead the way. And I believe that God wants to challenge us, and I'm hoping that you won't be in this place today. Maybe your kids are old and grown and gone out of the house. Uh, well, I've been told my kids aren't there yet. I have a a senior, and I have a junior and a 13-year-old, a 7th grader, and uh, everybody that's told me is, hey, you'll never stop parenting. That's right. And I'm kind of like, really? <laughs> I was kind of hoping that, I love my kids, but I was kind of hoping that when they got out of the house and on their own, I was kind of done with that. <laughs> but evidently, from what I said, that doesn't ever end. And I'm glad 
that I'm still going to be involved in their life. And hopefully they keep saying, oh, it's going to be different. They're going to love you and they're going to come back and thank you. I'm waiting for that day. I'm <laughs> believing that they're going to come back and say, oh, Dad, you are the best ever. And I, you know, we'll see if that really happens. But that's what I've been told for those who are experienced. But the reality is that you and I, I believe that God wants to speak to our hearts. No matter where we are in our life, no matter who's left in our home, we still come in contact with the next generation. Now, for those of you that are more seasoned than others, there are going to be more generations for you to lead the way. For those of you, and especially students who are here, you know what, don't say that it's just because we're going to see a story here of two characters. It's not just for the adults, but students have a responsibility as well to bear that leading the way, if you will, following the leader and letting those kids who are following you. I say every year at camp. Because we have uh, student staff who help us. We have adults, um, like, well, I say I use that word adult loosely, like pastor, he talked about that, adult. Uh, we, have, we have those adults that come and serve, but we also have students that come. And I tell every year our student staff, because you have to have completed eighth grade in order to help. All of those kids that come to kids camp and all those kids that aren't that age, they watch every one of those uh, high school students come to camp and they're, you know, they always like, I can't wait to staff. Yes, they, they like being around camp and all that, but the reality is they, they watch those students and they're like, I see them. And I want to be like them in a way. And so for you and I, how are we leading the way? How are we leading the way for the next generation? How are we leading the way? As Pastor was talking about that seat, and it sparked something, I got to thinking about, you know, that is so true for you and I. Because we have a tendency to think, well, okay, I'm just worried about right now. I just want to buy my seat for right now. And that's great. That's awesome. But for me, I don't want to do something that's just for the right now. I don't want to be able to buy it so that I can put a sticker or a, a plaque on there that says, Darren Stroud sat here. Darren Stroud gave so much money and I had this chair. What I want is so that I can have that chair for now but also for those who are going to come after me and the next chair and the next chair and the next chair. And I believe that God wants to speak to us in a profound way this morning because we have an opportunity to understand that we can and should be leading the way. For students to understand that they can follow us and do something. So that brings uh, us to our story in First. Uh, Samuel chapter 3, and would you do me a favor, you just need to uh, change, Just I'm going to be standing for a while, but why don't you stand as we read uh, the word of God this morning. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Verse 1, meanwhile, and we'll get there in just a few moments, meanwhile, well, well, what happened before that, but meanwhile, the boy Samuel, so here's one character, the boy Samuel, served the Lord by assisting Eli. There's our second character. Now in those days, now we, at that point, we don't really know. Assisting, what does that mean? We're going to find out. But in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare. And that's something that I, I don't have time to get into. And visions were quite uncommon. Verse 2, one night. I want you to think about that for just a moment. One night, Eli. For any one of us, it can be just a moment. Right. At any moment. We don't know. It could be night. It could be day. It could be just a, a conversation. We have no idea what could be the tipping point, not only for a miracle in our life, but also for a profound impact on somebody else's life. It says, One night Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle, so he's in church doing what a little boy, we don't really know how old he was, but he was, he was pretty young. He was sleeping in church. Anybody ever slept in church before? Mm -hmm. Not during the message. We know you don't sleep during pastor's message. I know that. But slept on a pew, <laughs> slept in church near the ark of God. And you got to go back to the Old Testament to understand that's the presence of God, the ark of God. That is a tangible presence of God. Suddenly the... Lord called out, Samuel, yes, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, go back to bed. He's, 
probably woke up the old man. He probably woke up Eli. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son. Go back to bed. Your kids ever wake you up for no reason? When you're asleep, you just got into that REM sleep, you know, you're sleeping good and some noise and they wake you up. It's like, go to bed. Okay, well, maybe it's just my family. All right, verse 7. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Now, remember verse 2. Samuel, he's, it says he's assisting, the, he's, he's serving the Lord by assisting Eli. But then here it's saying he didn't know the Lord. I think that's kind of interesting. We'll talk about that. Because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time. And once more, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? Now this kid is doing pretty good. I mean, he's hearing something. Three times he comes and he goes to talk to Eli. Then Eli, notice what it took three times. Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. Boy, so he called, or he said to Samuel, "Go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening.' So Samuel went back to bed, and the Lord came and called as before. So now this is the fourth time, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel replied, 'Speak, your servant is listening.' Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity that we can read your word, we can hear your voice." Help us to hear what you want us to hear and to be able to respond, not just in the here and now, but each and every day of our life. We thank you and ask this in your name. Amen. You can be seated. For many of you, this is a familiar passage, but let me give you a little background. We, we mentioned in verse 1, it says, meanwhile, well, you got to go back to the previous chapter uh, and even a couple of chapters before to, to really know what's going on. Eli was a priest in the time of the judges. Now, during that time, the, the judges and Eli, was he was given the, the reign, if you will, to take care of God's house, to take care of God's affairs. That's a huge responsibility. That goes all the way back to the early part of Israel's history where God set up this hierarchy and how it was to be done. And I'm not going to go through all of it, but one thing you need to understand, you can read this in chapter 2, is Eli's sons were wicked, and they didn't serve God. So let's kind of contemporize this now. We're talking about a pastor whose sons didn't serve God, and they were wicked. Matter of fact, the Bible in different translations use words like worthless and scoundrels. Now, we don't hear words like that very often. Now, we hear worthless. We don't hear scoundrel. I mean, you know, ornery, but it's even stronger than that. Think about it. God is saying some extremely strong words about these PKs, about these pastor's kids, about these two sons of Eli. That speaks to my heart as a pastor. That speaks to my heart as a dad. That speaks to my heart because... Eli, the Bible says that Eli knew what his sons were doing, and he didn't even stop them. God decides that he's going to punish those boys, and uh, also Eli. The tribe of Levi was promised that they would always be priests. You have to go back earlier in the Old Testament, and God says that he's going to change that. So God sets up this this structure and the way that it's going to be, and hey, the Levites are going to do this, and the Danites, and all these things. And the Levites, in essence, had the most important, the most, uh, the best job in that they were taking care of God's affairs. And it had been this way up until now. And because of the actions of his sons, God changes that. He says, I'm going to change it. I, I said this is the way that it's going to be, but I'm going to change it, and this is what's going to happen. The family line will end with Levi's or with Eli's sons, and they will no longer be priests again. For those of you who are fathers, I want you to think about the magnitude, and there's a lot of spiritual correlation there. But imagine if God or if anybody came up and said, Hey, I'm gonna shut your line down, you're gonna be cursed, and the the your name, your family name, and for a guy, that's a big deal. I tell my kids when you're going to school or when you're going to do something, hey, remember you're a Stroud. That means a lot to me. My name, my reputation. 
how we handle ourselves, uh, what, what people think of us. And we're not trying to be people pleasers, but I want to do things the right way. And that if somebody came along and said, hey, your line is going to be wiped out, that would be a big deal to me. But why? Because of what took place, not just, yes, those boys had their own decisions to make, but I believe what God wants us to understand is that Eli could have done something about it. Yes, they may have been able to make their own decisions and they have to pay for those consequences. We understand that as parents. We don't like when our kids do something that's going to hurt them. But there are times when the reality is that, hey, you know what? You made that decision. Now you have to pay for that consequence. And as a parent, that pains me. But that's what's got to happen. <coughs> but Eli didn't do anything about it. He looked the other way. And there are too many parents, both real parents of children and spiritual parents that are looking the other way. They're saying, hey, you know what? I see what's going on, but uh, somebody else will take up the responsibility. That's somebody else's job. And I believe what God is wanting us to understand is that it's our responsibility, each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. So that brings, that's a background, but now that brings us to Samuel. While all this is happening, Samuel is a little boy. He's growing up under the leadership of Eli. Now, we don't know all the details, but you've got, I've got to believe by what we've read that Samuel has to be a very perceptive little kid. You, if you've ever been around kids, kids can, they can sniff out a fake. They can sniff out uh, the truth. They can sniff out. They may not, and that's why the Bible talks about their innocence, because they can, they can notice those things. And I believe that Samuel, even though he's not a part of Eli's family, he's noticing what those boys are doing. But even more so, he's noticing that Eli is not doing anything about it. He's looking the other way. He's in the house. He's in the church and he's ministering. And 1 Samuel chapter 2 says that even though he is only a boy, he's serving the Lord. Let me pause for just a moment. You and I, I think, need to grasp the importance and never forget that no matter how young, no matter what they look like, no matter what their last name is, no matter what their home situation is, that you and I need to understand that God can and is and will use children and he will use students that we should not look down on them. And you'll hear some examples and stories in just a few minutes. We, we can't, hey, you're, you're just a kid. Now, I understand experience. I understand that there are some things, uh, the, the school of hard knocks. There, there are some times that students, you know, we, we don't want to just give them everything and let them, oh, trust me, my, my boys are going to mow the yard. Okay? I am strong enough. I am able to do it. I've been doing it long enough. But I believe that's why God gave me boys. <laughs> And strong boys, they can do the yard. They need to learn that. They need to learn that responsibility. <laughs> but I also need to know that God can speak to them personally. Mm -hmm. He can use them personally. He can use them and speak to them in a powerful way. That's what was happening, happening with Samuel. So that brings us to our actual text. As we've, given, uh, we've looked at all this background. And I believe that the details that are filled in here are symbolic and relevant not only to the events of what happened then, but also can translate to you and I today. And there are a few insights that I want us to look at that will help us as we lead the way for the next generation. The first insight is spiritual insight. Look at, as we talked about, Eli's eyes. And it was an extension of his spiritual insight. The Bible says that in one translation... His eyes were so weak that he could barely see, or in what I read, that he was almost blind. Now, here is a priest who has been charged by God himself to take up the responsibilities and to do the, the work of God and take care of the church and, and very much just like pastor and what he does on behalf of God's people. He is not only not able to see physically, but I believe that he is not seeing spiritually as well what his boys are doing. And let me ask us a few questions. <clears throat> as a generation 
of who has others following us. No matter what the age are, what are we seeing and perceiving spiritually? Think about that for a moment. What is God revealing to you <coughs> through His Word? How is God speaking to you by His Holy Spirit? And what is God doing in and through you and I, not just through our pastor? Praise God for the spiritual leadership. I believe in that. That is biblical. I, I am so for that. But uh, a friend of mine years ago, uh, I had two of his kids in our youth group. And we were kind of struggling. There were some people that left the church and some people that left the youth group because a new pastor came in town and all that. And, and this guy, he was one of our Royal Ranger commanders. And uh, we were actually playing tennis and talking about it. And I was kind of just discouraged a little bit. And uh, I said, you know, a lot of these people... Uh, and I don't know if you've heard this, Pastor, probably not because you're preaching, but a lot of times people will go and they'll go other places and like, you know, you get the excuse, well, I, I'm just not fed anymore. And uh, I was discouraged by that. And this dad said, hey, you know what? I always thought when I sit down at the dinner table, I've got to take this food and feed myself. I'm old enough, I've got to feed myself. And he said, they're old enough. They've got to feed themselves. And, I, you know, that really encouraged me. That really liberated me to understand, yes, I have a spiritual responsibility to present the Word of God and to study and know what God is saying. But the reality is that you and I in the pew, yeah. and every day on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we've got to feed ourselves. I'm, I'm starving right now. My stomach is growling. And I, you know what? I'm going to eat. I don't know what I'm going to eat, where I'm going to eat, what I'm going to I'm going to eat. But I know this. In a spiritual sense, I can't depend on Pastor Terry, our district superintendent, at district council, or in our staff meetings on Wednesday, or any other time, to feed me. My wife is an amazing woman of God. And when she cooks, she is awesome at cooking a homemade meal. But I can't wait for that. I've got to feed myself. And I believe that you and I as leaders have to have the spiritual insight yes. to feed ourselves and feed those who are following us. Because that's what, that's what Eli should have been doing. Yes, he was going blind physically, but I believe he was also going blind spiritually. He wasn't didn't have the spiritual insight that he did because he should have been passing this on to his boys and he should have been passing this on to Samuel. God is still speaking. He's a still speaking God and he wants to and will reveal his mysteries through his word for you personally. I know God will use your pastor and he will speak to him just like he did earlier today. What about Tuesday? What about Monday morning? For those of you that struggle and don't like Mondays, can he still speak Monday? Yeah, if you're in his word, if you're praying, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, all of those things, spiritual insight. The second uh, thing that I noticed from this passage is, is his light is still on. His light is still on. I always chuckle uh, and Different things amuse me probably than other people, but I'm on the road a lot, and I'm either driving, uh, or well, I'm driving most of the time, and I'm listening to the radio, or when I'm at home and I'm watching something, and a commercial will come on, and uh, one in particular, uh, Motel 6, I don't know if you've ever, they're, they're not as often um, as they used to be, but uh, Motel 6 would come on, and I really like the creativity and uh, the little jingle, but uh, there's a guy, he's the spokesperson for Motel 6. Anybody know who he is? Tom Bodette. That's right. Tom Bodette. And just the way, you got to say, you can't say Bodette. You got to say Tom Bodette. You got to have that, that twang or whatever that is. Uh, and he's a spokesman. And I like the interesting way and the creativity. Um, he gives some kind of like quote and some kind of story from life and a description of his hotel chain. And it's kind of all wrapping up. And he ends always like this. And we'll leave the light on for you. I'm thankful that God's light is still shining in my life Amen. and in the life of the church. And uh, I love coming back to places, not just one time, like here, because as, as Pastor said, we get to see him in lots of situations and it wasn't as bad as he made it sound. 
but coming to the church and seeing, and again, next time, seeing not just the look of the church, uh, of the pews and the chairs, but also what God is doing. The most important thing is, is what is God doing in the life spiritually of us as individuals and then corporately as a church? I know this world seems bleak. I know we hear all, I mean, between the, the race stuff and uh, uh, the violence and, I mean, the, the agendas of same sex. I mean, I know. I know. I, I am bombarded by social media. That's where I get my info. And I know it sounds bleak. I know it sounds uh, horrible. It's kind of like, man, I would just like to tune it all off and not listen to any of it. But we can't do that. But in the middle of all of that, I know this. That God's light is still shining. That's right. That's right. There is a brightness. As, as Carrie was talking about, that there is a, a word of our testimony. The blood of the Lamb. He is still shining bright. Yes. The mention of the lamp of God in verse 3, still burning, is not only a temporal thing, like a, like a candle, if you will, but it also realizes the symbol of Samuel's presence in a place where there was probably the, the worship center, as we know, the, the tabernacle. And we get a sense that because of Eli's passivity and because of the sin of his boys, and it says that Eli was in bed, and I believe that, yes, he was physically in bed, but I think a lot of times he was spiritually in bed as well. And in the middle of this, Samuel, just a little boy, who knows, probably in elementary school, maybe 10 years old. He is there. He's not only present, but he's sleeping. He is there in the present. He is getting, he is as close to the tangible presence of God as possible in the tabernacle, in the church, on the pew, on the platform, next to the pulpit, whatever you want to call it, he is there. And I think that that's significant of what God is wanting to speak. Eli wasn't as close to the presence of God that Samuel was, even though he was the priest of God. That's powerful. That's significant. Because you and I are supposed to be more spiritually mature and be leading the way for the next generations that are following us. His light should be in us. His light should be shining. So when a student or a child comes in contact with you, they should see, in essence, the very encounter of God. Just like Moses, his whole face was changed because he encountered God. When they see you, they shouldn't see, oh, oh I don't know how I'm going to make it and, and man, this world is bleak and all of this and I don't know, but instead, I'm not talking about faking it until you make it. I'm talking about, you know what? Life is hard. Life is difficult, but my God is greater. Amen. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And you know what? Let me tell you the reality, kid. You know, it, it can be difficult. I, I may have lost my job or I may have gotten my hours cut or something like that. But let me tell you about God's faithfulness. There was a time and you go on and you start to share those things because God's light is still shining. If we don't believe that, you know, pastor was pretty strong. We may as well sit down. Well, I would say if we don't believe that as a church, we may as well just shut the doors. Mm -hmm. yep. We may as well just take the sign off. We might as well just say, you know what? I can do something else on Sunday morning or Wednesday or whenever it is. And I believe that there is a remnant. I believe that there is a church, that there are individuals that say, you know what? It's not perfect. It's not, it's not maybe where we want it to be, but God is still shining. His light is still on. They aren't too young. They aren't too experienced or they aren't unable to let God fill them and draw them and use them. Samuel is an example <coughs> Of his light yes. still being on. Amen. And then the other observation is, is his voice still speaks. Yes. God started speaking to Samuel. He didn't know the Lord. And I, I think that's so interesting that he didn't know the Lord. However, Samuel at first went to Eli for further instructions. Eli, as we read and talked about, he turned Samuel away. And there could be a lot of reasons, maybe because Eli didn't uh, see at that time how God could tangibly, personally speak and encounter right. himself in that man. I, I don't know. I'm not going to try and read into that. But on the fourth approach to Samuel, the Lord called him and he responded yes. positively. I'm not sure about you, but personally, I don't want to miss when God is speaking oh, 
and moving. I want to be in the flow. I want to be in, in the river. I want to be, that's why we have to be in His presence daily. That's why it can't just be when we have the, the great worship team and when we have the worship music and, and uh, we have somebody speaking the word, but that's why every day, taking the spoon, opening up the word of God, feeding myself and allowing His presence and taking time to just be still yes. yeah. before God. Amen. It's not just the pastor's job. God has saved us. He has saved you. So if he saved you, you build that relationship. Hallelujah. And he still speaks. I love in Hebrews how in the past God spoke to our forefathers and through the prophets. But in these last days, he is still speaking to Hallelujah. us by his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank God that his spirit is still speaking and moving and nudging. God is still calling. Students are hearing the voice of God. To give their lives through yes. service. I, I just heard uh, actually from uh, one of your friends, from, from Pastor Charlie, who uh, we, we, went, we had a, an event a couple of weeks ago over spring break called Saturate. And it's a spring break missions experience. And uh, he was telling me that uh, a few of his middle school students. Now, I have a middle school student, okay? I know how middle school students can be. Um, they, they're, they're squirrely. You know, one day it can be this and one day it can be that. And they, they have no idea. They're not mature. They're not responsible. But check this out. They get back from middle or from saturate and they go back and they feel inspired. They feel challenged and they feel like, you know what? God wants us to do something. We're going to start a Bible club. And they start doing it and they're averaging about 16 kids in their Bible club. Now, if I were to tell my son, hey, you need to start a Bible club, that's not going to work. He's going to be like, Dad, I don't want to, you know, I mean, but that, that's the way. But when God speaks, I'm telling you, they'll still be like, hey, I want to do it. And that's exciting. That's thrilling. They take a stand for their beliefs. I love hearing stories about students standing up when it's difficult, standing up, writing a report, giving an oral report, whatever the case is, when there's school and all of the stuff and all of the negativity and all of the, the sexuality and all of that where students are still letting God speak to them and use them and do something amazing. Amen. It's happening through giving. This past week, Pastor was a part of our district council, and uh, we had a, on Tuesday, and I, I know I've been here multiple times for Speed the Light, but uh, we had a Speed the Light luncheon on Tuesday, and we challenged churches to continue. And uh, last year in Kansas... Kansas middle school and high school stu uh, students with churches joined together, and we gave $200,000 to Speed the Light, placed 13th in the nation. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Who says students don't have money <laughs> or that they won't give money? And then, and then your church, your church, 60 churches in the state of Kansas gave to Speed the Light out of 143. That's a whole nother that's a whole other thing that I, I'm not going to get into. 60 out of 143. But your church ranks 16. Well, no, 12. Sorry, 12. Thank you. Come on now. Yeah, sorry. 12 out of 60, over $3,000. So I know, I know that uh, they are gone, but would you pass this on uh, to them and thank them? And I hope I'll get to talk to them hopefully in person. But congratulations. Thank you. See, that, that's not just a leader, but that's students, yes. God speaking and moving and challenging and realizing, you know what, I've got to do my part. I have to do something. He's still yes. doing it. Amen. Missions, Randy and Marilyn, thank you on and on and on. Please extend my thank you to them. And I, I, I've got to move on. Samuel, here's, here's the rest of the story. Samuel's first act as a prophet had to have been probably the most difficult. He was only a child. And the word that God spoke to him, I, I can't even amount, uh, imagine it. It was Lord, the, God's fatal judgment against Israel. I mean, I wouldn't even want that responsibility as an adult, let alone as a little boy to say, Hey, hey Israel, guess what? God's going to judge you. I, I can't even imagine that. His message came on the heels of an unnamed prophet giving this condemnation on the house of Eli. And it confirmed that God was going to judge. That could not have been easy. But one thing I know, maybe a little bit more different than adults, that when a student knows this is what God wants them to do, where they need to go, what they need to say, any of those things, you know, they don't, 
they don't necessarily think about all the excuses and the reasons and all that. They just know that innocence, again, hey, God said to do it, I'm going to do it. Compared to you and I as adults, sometimes we're like, oh, but yeah, what about this and this and, you know, all of those types of things. I heard about a high school music appreciation <laughs> class where the students were asked the difference between listening and hearing. It took a while before somebody raised their hand, but eventually one of them gave this definition. You see it up there. Listening is wanting to hear. Hmm. Wanting to hear. I want to hear God's voice. I'm so thankful that you are still here and you're in a place. And I saw that you have prayer tonight and those times where you want to hear God's voice on a regular daily basis. Yes. And then the last insight is we can't stop the plan of God. I'm so glad. I'm so glad when opposition, when principalities and powers and all of those things come, that God's plan is not going to be stopped. We don't have time to go through all the story, but in verse 19 of chapter 3, the Bible says the Lord was with Samuel. And basically what ended up happening is Samuel became this prophet that the Bible says that his words did not fall by the wayside. So in essence, what he's saying is compared to other people that would call themselves a prophet, pretend to be a prophet, when they would say something, it didn't always come to pass. But when Samuel heard the voice of God, knew God spoke, when he said it, it happened. And there was nobody since the time of Moses until Samuel that became what Samuel did. Absolutely incredible rest of the story. So this brings me to our Conclusion on December 7th, 1988. Some of you may remember this date or this year. It's actually when I graduated from high school. There was an earthquake measuring 6.9 on the Richter scale in Armenia, which was a part of Soviet Union. And I know by now most of us have heard about the earthquake that happened yesterday uh, in Nepal or on Friday in Nepal. That was a 7.9. This was 6.5. And uh, in that time period, 25,000 people died. Over 15,000 were injured. And the damage totaled about $14 billion. So we don't even know. Uh, and I just happened to see some pictures and video yesterday uh, from India. But we have no idea the extent of what that's going to be. But there, a story came out of there that there was a man who, like he always did, he took his son to school. They would walk to school and he would drop his son off at the school and then he would go and he would come back and do his thing. But after he dropped him off, he got a, a few blocks away and this earthquake hit. The man waited for all the shaking to stop before he sprinted back to the school. And as he ran, he's noticing all of the buildings and the crumblings on the side of the street. And as I read this story, I can't even imagine what's going through his mind. And as I read it, I'm thinking, putting myself into that situation. People were stunned and their screams echoing all through. And when he gets back to the school, the school is leveled in a heap. Their parents... And there are police, and there's all kinds of people obviously around, onlookers, and they're looking at what used to be this school. It was unsafe to do anything at that moment, except for this father. This father didn't waste any time. Immediately, he started picking up stones and moving things and uh, eyewitnesses say that there were stones and, and pieces of rubble that were he was moving and picking up that were larger than himself, that there's no way that he should have been able to do that. People were urging, and this is what they were saying. They said, you know they're dead. You can't help. Even a policeman encouraged him to stop. But the father kept digging and digging. Hours passed. A full day passed. No sign of his son. He didn't eat. He didn't stop. There were no other survivors. Nothing else. The, the father just kept digging and digging and digging until out of the depths of the rubble, he heard a, a little small voice and a noise kind of wrestling under there. And within minutes, it revealed a small opening below the surface where he saw several kids, including his son. Armin, grab my hand. Father, it's me. I, listen to what he said. 
I told the other kids not to worry. I told them if you were alive, you'd save me. And when you'd save me, they would be saved too. Because you promised me, no matter what, I'll always be there for you. I know in my personal life, I haven't always necessarily had a dad that was there for me. But I've always had somebody. First and foremost is my Heavenly Father. At 12 years old, I gave my heart to the Lord, and He's been leading the way for me the rest of my life. But then I had a youth pastor who brought me to the Lord. Then I went to Bible college. And I had professors. Then I met my wife and we got married and my father-in-law. And then I came to Kansas and I had spiritual leaders and pastors and friends that continue to lead the way for me. And I don't know about you, but ultimately Jesus is leading the way. He's giving spiritual insight. He's still speaking. His light is still on. His plan is not going to be stopped. And I bear the responsibility to lead the way for the next generation. And so do you. When you hear that story about uh, the, the father digging and trying to, to find, I ask you this. Do you assume that boy is you or someone else? Are you so worried about saving others for Jesus that you've sometimes forgotten that Jesus is saving you? We are going to be in one and maybe even both of those situations. Eli was passive. He loved his sons more than God. It cost him his lineage. And I believe that God wants to lead, help us to lead the way for those who are coming after us. Would you pray with me, Jesus? Jesus, I, I hope this didn't come across as a harsh word, God, but instead... I don't apologize for the word of God, but I do, as I read this story, and so many others like it in the word of God, I understand the magnitude of, our, of my responsibility. <clears throat> Maybe it's a little bit easier for me because I still have kids in my home and I still work with students, but God, for this church, for these individuals, whether it's here at this church or around the community, I believe that all of us in some way will still encounter a kid. A child, a middle school student, a high school student, maybe even a young adult if we're older. Some of us feel unqualified. What, what do I have to offer? What can I say? They don't want to listen to me, but I truly believe if we'll take the time We'll just show love. That if we lead the way first and foremost spiritually, it'll give them something to follow. If we demonstrate that your light is still alive in us, that your spirit is still moving and speaking through us, that you will not stop their plan, God. I know that there will be a connection. May we be the dad that is still there. We will not give up. We will not give up on this generation. We will move the stones. We will move the rubble. We will say, we will not sleep. We will not eat. We will do what we've got to do. But God, maybe there's somebody in this place today that is the kid that's buried. And you're the father. You're pursuing. You're not giving up. May they know you will always run after them. You will always dig. You will always chase. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed.